On February 22, 1992, Kirk Crossman and his friend, 34-year-old Jimmy Robertson, were at work on a construction site in El Cajon, California. Jimmy and I were up on a scaffolding using a finished nail gun to nail boards onto the ceiling. The nail gun runs on 100 pounds per square inch of air pressure. We were aware of the fact that a lot of the tools can be very dangerous, but you do kind of get to the point where you don't really think about the fact that it, they could actually kill, kill a person. Again, I knew that it was serious and I was I was just scared I turned around to look at Jimmy and he ripped his shirt open and I knew at that point that there was at least an inch and three quarters of nail inside of Jimmy in the area of his heart the company that we worked for had trained us in CPR and first aid and he wasn't in shock that I could tell he was walking along fine. It was all I could do to keep him from running. I was starting to get the impression that maybe the nail went in and didn't hit anything. I went in the office to see where the nearest urgent care center was. But looking back, the best move would have definitely been dial 911 and let them handle it. Jimmy was doing fine at first, but as we got a half a mile from this job site, he started to complain of pain in the side of his neck. The last thing he said was that he's going to he's going to die. I blew through a couple of red lights. He began convulsing and shaking. His head hit the steering column of my pickup truck, throwing it in park. I didn't know what to do. Jimmy was dying in my, in my truck. Jim, hey! And the only thing that came to mind was sometimes you just got to scream at him, holler at him, you know, try to get, get their attention. Wake up, wake up! Come on. All of a sudden, his eyes just rolled back into his head, on, and he was with us again. I noticed the sheriff's car in the parking lot at the mini mall. San Diego County Sheriff's Deputy Lenise Lopez was on routine patrol. What's wrong? He told me gunshot to the chest. I have seen plenty of gunshot wounds, and most of them are fatal. 141, Hamishaw and Chase, give me life five. We gotta get him to a ready care. He was sweating, but he was cold. He was losing it real fast. Okay. I asked his friend, what kind of gun is this? And then that's when he told me it was a nail gun. By then, Doug Newkirk, my partner, was there. Okay. What's his name? What's his name? What's his Jim. Okay, Jim. Jim, I'm Lenny. He was semi-conscious. It seemed like he could look at me and see someone. But I saw how fast he was dying and he needed to fight. I've known who Jimmy was for a number of years. He was uh, one of the guys you used to look up to when you were younger. I kept praying that um, everything was going to work out, be OK. What's our ETA for Life Flight? Doug Newkirk notified me that Life Flight was fogged in. And I yelled, get me Astria, the sheriff's helicopter. It was just a sense of helplessness. I couldn't make this better for him right now within four minutes of the call the first rescue units with the san miguel fire department got to the scene once they arrived i was relieved because my support can only last so long a hearts and advanced life support unit arrived to help treat the victim including paramedic Michael McKinley. The firefighters were there already uh, doing some basic life support. Can we get a couple IVs set up, please, in the IV tray? 
He was very purple in the chest and his veins were huge. They were about the size of a breadstick on either side of his neck, indicating that there was a backup of blood in the system. That's a classic sign and symptom of a uh, piercing injury to the heart. One, two, three, coming under. They talk about the golden hour, but uh, in this case, it was more like the golden minute or the golden quarter hour. He needed to be in now. Two, five, six, this is Sharp, it's 9.59. The trauma team at Sharp Memorial Hospital was put on alert. A uh, chief status patient shot in the chest with a nail gun. When we encountered this gentleman, he's extremely diaphoretic. Uh, level of consciousness is going down. They are going to be getting en route to your facility as long as you can accept. Uh, can accept. We closed off the intersection. There was no traffic going through. Asteroid didn't have to circle around. They landed. We got him loaded on the Astria. Time was very important in this case. We hot-loaded the patient into the aircraft, meaning that the aircraft was not shut down, the blades were still turning, and this allowed us to have a faster response to the hospital. I said, Jim, you're going to be okay now. And he said, thank you. I turned away. I was upset at him. Thank me if I save your life, but not if I don't. I went to the paramedic. I asked him, what do you think? Do you think he's going to live? He said, it'd be a miracle. The flight to the trauma unit took five minutes. When we landed at Sharp Hospital, he looked at me. His eyes kind of rolled back in his head. And he said, you know, what am I going to do about my kids? You know, what am I going to do? And at that point, he, I think he knew he was going to die. At the hospital, Jim was put under the care of cardiac surgeon Robert Adamson. In general, a patient is taken into the trauma room where we get x-rays and draw blood work. But Jim's condition was so critical that he was taken directly to the operating room. We had just completed a routine bypass operation. And he had cardiac and trauma surgeons readily available. When we opened the chest, the sac surrounding the heart was filled with blood. It's not the amount of blood that Jim lost that, that uh, was dangerous. It was the fact that it was compressing his heart and not allowing his heart to plump blood to his body. I drove on to the hospital. I kept thinking about how I was going to tell Jimmy's mom. That was a very difficult call to make. When I first got the call, I had a real bad fear that he wasn't going to be there when we got there. As you may be aware, he's in the first thing he said to us was, your son is only alive because the system worked. Everything functioned properly, and he's alive. And we just said, thank God for that. After the surgery to repair the hole in Jim's heart, his parents, Francis and Olin Robertson, got a chance to visit their son. I don't believe we were prepared to see Jimmy the way he looked. We just stood there and looked at him for a minute, thinking, thanking God he was alive. Amazingly, Jim was hospitalized for only four days, but it's changed his life. He can no longer do strenuous construction work. I have to look for a new career now, so it's drastically changed my life. But I've been through the worst, and um, I'm, I'm going to make it. I'm definitely more cautious on the job site now and uh, stress safety first. But um, if it ever does occur again, I'm going to know. And I will call 911. I won't try to, to be the ambulance paramedic man myself. This accident has brought us closer together. I don't blame Kirk one bit for the accident. We're good friends. I feel I definitely owe my life to everybody that was involved that day. The whole system worked great. I mean, these people are heroes. I stay in contact with Lenise. We talk about every two weeks or so. Jim and I have a bond that only people that have been in this situation will understand. I, did a circle. I think that there was an angel watching over him that day. Everything worked for Jim.
and in the normal circumstances, the man would have died. Well, we're definitely going to stay by. When I was in the truck and I was about ready to give up, she asked me about my children. And I have three kids, six, five, and three. And uh, I, I was just recently divorced, and I don't see them as much as I would like. And, uh, when she brought the kids up, I couldn't go. I couldn't go. That gave me the mental strength to hang on. God sent me an angel when he said that. There's no gift more precious than life. We owe it to each other to learn CPR and basic life-saving techniques. You never know when you might need them. Courses are available through the American Red Cross and the American Heart Association. This series is dedicated to all the men and women who choose to get involved when a life is at stake. I'm William Shatner. Join us again next week for more true stories on Rescue 911.